Muchachos y muchachas, the Glenn Maxwell trial. As you guys might know by now, there is no live streaming of the trial. It's not going to be televised. And so therefore we have to rely on transcripts, documentation, and individuals who may have access to listen in on uh, the court proceedings. So with that being said, here at Natalie Denise, deet, 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 we will try and when I say we, I mean me because I'm a one woman show. I will be covering this day by day as the trial proceeds. And I will try my best to recap this and give you guys the juicy details as this continues on. So with that being said, stay right there. We're going to go through it. A bicyclist in Florida got a strange email from Google. It said law enforcement was requesting his user data. He had 10 days to go to court if he wanted to fight it. The bicyclist later found out that he was a suspect in a burglary. His Google location pinged him near the scene of the crime nearly one year ago. Law enforcement wanted access to his phone. However, he was innocent. He was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time, but his phone seemed to have betrayed him. This is why having a VPN like Virtual Shield is so important. Virtual Shield can hide your location from tech giants, on top of already hiding your internet history from your ISP. Using VPN prevents tech companies and law enforcement from false accusations like they did to this bicyclist. I highly recommend Virtual Shield VPN. Get 50% off for life with a free 30-day trial only by downloading it today. Go to virtualshield.com slash Natalie Denise or click the link in the description below. All right, now that we're back, the whole Glenn Maxwell trial. I want to start off by just running down very quickly the basics because I would think it's important to know who's who because we're going to hear these names repetitively. So I think that this is the perfect time to do that. Let's jump right in because there's a lot to cover. Okay, so let's start with the prosecution team. This is who is going up against Maxwell. Now, this particular detail actually made a lot of splashes on the social media space because it was quite controversial that James Comey's daughter is actually on the prosecution team. Now, she was also on other projects, you know, within the whole Epstein saga. Let's get to know the prosecution team in general. James Comey's daughter is on the Glenn Maxwell prosecution team coming from the Denver Gazette. Maureen Comey, 32, joins U.S. Attorney, Assistant U.S. Attorney Alex Rose Miller, Allison Gainfer Moe, Andrew Rohrbach, and Laura Elizabeth Pomerantz. You guys will hear that name a lot within the first day of this trial. In leading the case against Maxwell, whose trial begins today, November 29, 2021, in uh, accused of Maxwell of trafficking teenage girls for sex and sexually abusing them with Epstein. The Maxwell trial is not the first Epstein-related case Maureen Comey has worked on. When Epstein was indicted in July of 2019 for numerous sex crimes, she served as one of the lead prosecutors against him, Epstein, for his alleged fatality, we're just going to call it fatality, not S word, as many of the media claims, a month later. Another case she worked on was Nicholas Tartaglioni, the roommate of Epstein's back at the Manhattan's Metropolitan Correctional Center in 2019. Her LinkedIn page states that she was also worked as an assistant U.S. attorney at the Southern District of New York since 2015. She graduated from College of William & Mary in 2010. She earned her doctorate of law at Harvard Law School in 2013. So prosecution team, again, I'm going to name these names once again. Maureen Comey, attorneys Alex Ross Miller, Allison Gainford Moe, Andrew Rohrbach, and Laura Elizabeth Pomerantz in leading the case against Maxwell. Prosecution team. Now let's get to know who the defense team is. So Glenn Maxwell trial, who is the lead defense attorney? Let's scroll all the way down. Maxwell has a team of lawyers. When on November 1st, she appeared in pretrial hearing, Bobby Sternheim, Sternheim, excuse me, attorney Bobby Sternheim took the lead. Also in court documents filed in October of last year, Sternheim has said she will represent Maxwell in her sex trafficking case. Reportedly, others in the team are Laura Menninger and Jeff Paluka from Madden and Morgan Foreman in Denver, Christian Everdale and Renato Stabile. Continued on, 
Sternheim works for Fasulo Braverman DiMaggio LLP, and the bio of her company's website reads, a recognized leader in the local and national criminal defense bar for litigating difficult and complex cases, and she uses her courtroom and advocacy skills in New York and beyond. Continued on, this... I, believe that this was important. It notes that the council's case portfolio is extensive, covering a wide range of criminal and civil matters. Stern, Sternheim, who is the lead defense attorney, holds a top secret slash SCI clearance and has represented individuals extradited internationally. Makes me wonder who else she's going to maybe represent in upcoming cases. Notable civil cases include a gender discrimination suit against the mission of Saudi Arabia, a financial interpleader action against Imelda Marcos, and a medical malpractice suit as the United States Bureau of Prisons. Meanwhile, this part is also additional to the entire saga. So I actually went over this on my podcast, Unravel with Natalie Denise, uh, the Nightly with Natalie segment, Monday through Friday, uh, 9.30 p.m., central time you want to tune into those podcasts as well because there might be things that happen after hours that i catch on and could put on my podcast but i went over this that the maxwell siblings are also holding a team of lawyers because they are making other requests such as pleading the un to release somehow release uh, glenn maxwell meanwhile besides the defense team there are lawyers who are working on behalf of the maxwell siblings a few days ago paris-based lawyers found Francois Zimre and Jessica Fennell filed a complaint with the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention alleging that the British socialite, Glenn Maxwell, is subject to inhumane and degrading conditions inside the jail. Okay? So there is the defense team, Bobby Sternheim, the lead, Laura Menninger and Jeff Paluca, Christian Everdale and Renato Sibiel. Okay? So you will see those names possibly pop up in the coverage of the Galen Maxwell trial. Now, what is Galen Maxwell being charged with? Let's just run through a high level of that. The charges. Conspiracy to entice minors to travel to engage in illicit, illegal sex acts, five years max sentence. Enticement of a minor to engage in illegal sex acts, 20 years. Conspiracy, conspiracy to transport minors with the intent to engage in criminal sexual activity, 20 years. Transportation of a minor with intent to engage in criminal activity, 10 years. Sex trafficking conspiracy, sex trafficking of a minor. Glenn Maxwell also faces two charges of perjury. But those counts are due to be tried after the sex crimes trial. The charges relate to a testimony she gave in 2016 in a defamation case filed against her by Epstein accuser Virginia Roberts Jufre. So, the facts. Prosecutors say that Maxwell groomed three girls between 1994 and 1997 for Epstein. They are not named in the indictment, but allegedly targeted them in London, Florida, New York, and New Mexico. Maxwell is alleged to befriend the girls, asking them about their life and their schooling would put them at ease by uh, taking them to the movies, taking them shopping, winning their trust, later delivering them to Epstein. It's alleged. To normalize the abuse that would come after, prosecutors say she had rest in front of the girls herself and asked them sexual questions. She has not only facilitated Epstein abusing them, prosecutors say, but took part in some of it herself. The alleged sex abuse includes sexualized group massages. The indictment also says Maxwell made the girl feel indebted to Epstein by encouraging them to take money from them, let him pay for their education and travel. Now, I, this is just my commentary here, but these are some very classic signs of a possible madame. And I'm going to say possible because I'm being very careful here because all people uh, under trial are, are innocent until proven guilty. OK, so just making that disclaimer. But I'm just saying these if this is true, these are some very classic signs of a madame or an enabler within a trafficking ring. All right. So those are the charges. Now, let's get to the trial coverage. Now, what I'm going to do, just so you know, what I'm going to do is the New York Times was one of the only news publication outlets that kept up with the trial throughout the day. So I'm gonna start here, but what I'm going to do is supplement this with uh, a, a transcript that was kept up by another journalist from the inner, uh, inner city press who is, you know, covered a lot of 
Gillen related things. And I'll get to that as I go and supplement this info with his play by play of his coverage as well. So with that being said, let's jump to this and then I will supplement that information then. So from the New York Times, Glenn Maxwell exploited young girls and served them up to Epstein, a prosecutor said. Pro a federal prosecutor described Glenn Maxwell as a predator who targeted young girls for sexual abuse as opening arguments in the former socialites trial began Monday, today, afternoon in a Manhattan courtroom. As a quote, the defendant sexually exploited girls, Laura Pomerantz, the assistant U.S. attorney, told the jury, saying Ms. Maxwell developed trust with girls, helped normalize abusive sexual conduct, and then served them up to Jeffrey Epstein, her longtime companion. Ms. Maxwell, 59 years old, daughter of the British media tycoon, faces six counts stemming from what prosecutors say her role in facilitating sexual exploitation and abuse of girls by Mr. Epstein. She has steadfastly maintained her innocence. Ms. Pomerantz, who again is on the prosecution team, on Monday depicted Ms. Maxwell as more than just a facilitator of Mr. Epstein's abuse, saying they were partners in the crime. In addition to bringing girls in as masseuses for Mr. Epstein, Ms. Maxwell also sometimes in the room while the abuse took place and sometimes touched the girls herself, Ms. Pomerantz said. Behind closed doors, the defendant, this is a quote, behind closed doors, the defendant and Epstein were committing heinous crimes, Ms. Pomerant said. They were sexually abusing teenage girls. Ms. Maxwell is not charged with sexual abuse. The recruitment of girls for abuse evolved over the course of a decade, Ms. Pomerant said. In the 1990s, she said Ms. Maxwell, Mr. Epstein themselves recruited girls under the guise of mentorship and scholarship op opportunities by the 2000s, Ms. Pomerant said they have devised a pyramid scheme of abuse in which they encourage girls to recruit other girls. On Monday, Ms. Maxwell entered the courtroom without handcuffs, wearing a cream colored sweater and black pants. About two dozen spectators lined the courtroom benches during the opening statements. The charges against Ms. Maxwell center on four accusers who say she groomed them to be abused by Mr. Epstein between 94, 1994 and 2004 when they were underage. Those accusers, now adults, are expected to testify during trial under pseudonyms or partial names, prosecutors have said. Ms. Pomerantz began her opening story of one of those accusers identified in court as only as Jane, who Ms. Pomerantz said Ms. met Mr. Epstein and Ms. Maxwell when the couple visited a summer camp for talented children. Jane was 14 years old, and Ms. Pomerant said that this meeting was the beginning of a nightmare that would last for years. Ms. Maxwell's lawyers have signaled that they will try to undermine the credibility of the accuser's testimony and question the government's motives for bringing in a case against Ms. Maxwell. Her trial is widely seen as a proxy for prosecution of Mr. Epstein, which has thwarted when he died in custody in 2019, about a month after his arrest. Ms. Pomerant suggested a possible motive for Ms. Maxwell's participation, noting as the abuse took place, Ms. Maxwell was jet setting in private planes and living a life of extraordinary luxury. The girls, Ms. Pomerant said, were just a means to support her lifestyle, a way making sure that Epstein, who demanded constant sexual gratification from girls, remained satisfied. Now, what I can say from, you know, I, I did cover a lot of epstein news when i had my channel the daily traffic and from what i can see you know i can uh, exemplify something that could be implicated in this trial but i do recall that there were, were some what seemed to be like order forms like legitimate order forms for girls and it seemed to be or it is alleged that that was glenn maxwell's handwriting now this was um, in specific. There were certain examples where there was like, you know, uh, a Russian, you know, dancer, you know, uh, it, it was it was very specific. But there were order forms uh, in which is alleged to be in the handwriting of Glenn Maxwell, which would implicate this is just an example. And I'm not saying that this is going to be in the trial, but it could be. But this is just an example of how they could use something like that to uh, leverage that, hey, she had some doing in the case of procuring underage children, uh, children in, you know, uh, the abuse that Epstein transpired. Now, the defense team. 
Now, again, this was, uh, you know, Starnheim was the lead defense. And so going into this, this is what they allege. And this is what they're claiming as a defense for Glenn Maxwell. A defense lawyer suggested to jurors on Monday that the sex trafficking case against Glenn Maxwell continued that Glenn Maxwell was a misdirected effort by prosecutors who targeted her because they had lost a chance to put the disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein on trial. The lawyer, Bobby C. Sternheim, took her turn addressing jurors after, uh, jurors after the prosecutor delivered a 35-minute opening statement that painted Miss Maxwell in harsh terms as someone who played an essential role in a decade-long scheme to entice and manipulate teenage girls who were groomed methodically when sexually abused by Mr. M Epstein. Ms. Sternheim, in defense, described her client as a scapegoat for Mr. Epstein's actions. Ever since Eve was accused of tempting Adam with an apple, she said, women have been blamed for a bad behavior of men. Now, this is where <laughs> I have a lot more commentary, obviously, for the, def the defense, because I we're just going to have to pick apart the de defense a lot, I think, closer. But this was just a weird injection, you know, uh, you, the whole Adam and Eve you know, uh, Genesis. I don't know why that was injected. That that was just a weird thing to me. She went on to say that Mr. Epstein's death while in federal custody in Manhattan had left a gaping hole for the pursuit of justice for many people. Miss Maxwell is the filling that hole, Miss Sternheim added, filling that empty chair. So let me just pause here and just give you guys just a recap. So Bobby Sternheim, who is the lead defense attorney for Glenn Maxwell is basically stating, you know, because Epstein had perished <laughs> and he's no longer in the picture and we can't get him on trial, they're actually trying to pursue pseudo justice on Glenn Maxwell. She has done nothing wrong. They're just trying to, uh, I guess, thirst or, or quench their thirst for justice through Glenn Maxwell. Now, we will see that transpire where there's going to be evidence and testimony uh, from witnesses and alleged victims. So we'll see what transpires or not. But that's her initial claim is that Glenn Maxwell is actually being used as a scapegoat because, you know, uh, uh, Jeffrey Epstein escaped justice because of his fatality. That's what she's saying, essentially, in my opinion. Uh, where was I? Ms. Sternheim urged jurors to be skeptical of the accounts they would hear from our witnesses who are expected to testify that they were abused by Mr. Epstein saying this case is about memory, manipulation and money. She added that the accusations from the mouths of four accusers, uh, accusers ac include unreliable and suspect memories that would have been corrupted over the years and contaminated by constant media reports. Ms. Sternheim also suggested repeatedly that the testimony of Ms. Maxwell's trial could be connected to a desire for a big jackpot of money. So, basically what Ms. Sternheim is also alleging in her defense of Maxwell is that, hey, these accusers uh, uh, or the, the alleged victims, their memories could be corrupted. There's been a lot of media stories and media coverage over this entire thing. And so that could have contaminated their memory and could have even infused their memories. Um, and on top of that, this is what she's claiming. On top of that, there's a big there's a big jackpot of money, you know, that they're going after. So, of course, they're going to, you know, be accusers and testi testify in this court. Now, this is the defense's claim, okay? She, so not only is Glenn being used as a scapegoat, but she's also alleging that the victims or the alleged victims are out for more money and that their memories are contaminated. Continued on. Ms. Sternheim also suggested repeatedly that the testimony of Ms. Maxwell's trial could be connected to a desire for a big jackpot of money. At one point, Ms. Sternheim likened Mr. Epstein to a 21st century James Bond, saying that his mystique and spurred curiosity and his accusers have shaken the money tree. During his, uh, her opening statement, Ms. Sternheim also sought counterparts for the government's narrative. Prosecutors have presented Ms. Maxwell as helping to lure girls who were sometimes flown by private jet to one of Mr. Epstein's residences where they were said to have been abused. The flights took place, Ms. Sternheim acknowledged, but they should have been thought of a sort of, I don't know what this means, Hamptons jitney in the air. I don't know what that means but she's trying to lessen the blow on the Lolita Express. Ferrying an array of Mr. Epstein's many accomplished friends, including academics and former astronaut. 
Ms. Sternheim told jurors some activity that prosecutors had referred to as grooming and lawful co conduct. The government wants you to put a sinister subjective motive, she said, there where the evidence will show none existed. So. Not so on top of everything that I explained, scapegoat uh, accusers have a uh, bad memory, you know, is what she's alleging this defense. And she's also alleging that the victims want more money. This is why they're doing this. But also, oh, the Lolita Express. Oh, it was a, it was a fairy. You know, it was a fairy for these multiple, you know, uh, academics and, and what have you. We've seen the list before the flight logs. Uh, this is also the flight logs are expected to be used in this trial so one of the first witnesses that have uh began testifying is the pilot mr fazoski the first witness in the glenn maxwell trial is one of epstein's pilots prosecutors in glenn maxwell's trial also called their first witness late monday afternoon larry fazoski one of jeffrey epstein's longtime pilots mr fazoski described in broad strokes the role miss maxwell played in managing mr epstein's household and properties describing the relationship as couple-ish guided by photographs presented at Epstein, Mr. Vazoski also described Mr. Epstein's residences. The government often uses the first witness to set the stage for the evidence and the testimony to come. Mr. Vazoski, who worked for Mr. Epstein from 90, 1991 to 2019, is in a position to explain to the jury where Mr. Epstein's homes were, how the financier's travel was arranged, and to introduce the evidence about who flew him. Mr. Vazoski said that he flew Mr. Epstein regularly, pretty much every four days on the road flying somewhere. He mostly flew Mr. Epstein between his palatial homes in New York City, Paris, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Palm Beach, Florida, and Santa Fe, New Mexico. The advantages of private air travel, Mr. Vazoski said, were that you can leave when you want and the security is much less, Mr. Vazoski said. He would not Oh, he would did not always know how to precise uh, who. I'm sorry. Let me repeat that. Mr. Vasoski said he did not always know precisely who was flying on Mr. Epstein's planes with him. Mr. Vasoski testified for about an hour and a half and an hour before a jury was dismissed for the day. He's expected to return tomorrow, Tuesday, to give a bit more detail to continue his testimony. So. As you guys know, uh, the, the the Lolita Express, we've seen some flight logs before. They are also, as I stated, are going to be expected to be presented within the trial. Flight logs for Mr. Epstein's planes made public through civil litigation showed that the passenger list often included prominent politicians, academics, Hollywood celebrities. A lawyer for Ms. Maxwell described the flights as a Hamptons jitney in the air for Mr. Epstein's friends and associates. So the flight logs, as stated uh, by Laura Pomerantz, the prosecution uh, lawyer, uh, that the flight logs would be part of the government's case against Ms. Maxwell. All right. So this is the New York Times account of how uh, this first day was recapped. Okay. So as I recapped this day one of the Gellin Maxwell trial, I will state that I w also went through some of the commentary play by play by Inner City Press, uh, who I would suggest if you would like some supplemental information and some very play by play sayings by the uh, prosecution, the defense and uh, by uh, Judge Nathan herself. Uh, you can go, I will link this thread in my uh, description below. So if you're looking for that supplemental, just play by play, you can go and visit this on your own time. Now about this particular journalist, the reason why I uh, have uh, read off and supported some of what uh, the uh, uh, recap by the New York Times has, you know, stated in, in their press coverage of this. Now, this particular journalist, the reason why, you know, I gravitated towards this play by play is because uh, Matthew Russell is with Inner City Press. He is one of the first and only journalists to actually investigate the connection between Glenn Maxwell's Terramar project and the UN. And he has named very particular players. And I actually covered this in a video that I did on the Terramar project, uh, the Foundation Oceanic Foundation that Glenn Maxwell had. 
So this is why I uh, chose to supplement and just kind of overview this. And I can say that, you know, between reading this a play-by-play transcript that he kept up with of the first day of trial and the New York Times coverage, it does seem to play hand in hand. It, it seems pretty similar. Uh, so, of course, the New York Times genericizes it a lot more uh, versus he is giving very intricate play-by-plays of what things are being said by who. So if you want to go check out this thread and get that supplemental info, I will again link this in my description below. So anyway, guys, this is the first day of the Glenn Maxwell trial. I will come back with more tomorrow as I cover and continue cover this uh, trial as it transpires. So anyway, give your guys, uh, please give me your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching this and stay in tune with the important things going on in this world. I will catch you guys in the next video. Goodbye.